Hey everyone, it's Dave Asprey with Bulletproof Radio. Today's cool fact of the day is something about why humans were motivated to develop language. At least we think about it because no one wrote it down. It might not have been just the desire to communicate with other people, but because it turns out that learning new words rewards your brain the same way that sex, drugs, and food do. Uh, I was reminded of this because right before recording this podcast, I had lunch with Alan, my five-year-old and he was just wanting to learn new words. So I just taught him the word ocular and he thought it was the coolest word ever. Today's guest is James Swanwick and I'm pronouncing that as an American word, not an Australian word, which is almost a different language. And I say that because James is an Australian American entrepreneur, a podcast host, and you've probably heard his voice because he's a former sports center anchor on ESPN and Hollywood correspondent. He's also interviewed a few celebrities, some people like Brad Pitt, Angelina Jolie, George Clooney, Arnold Schwarzenegger. By the way, the new Bulletproof Coffee Shop in Santa Monica that opens in February is downstairs from Arnold's office, or so I've heard. James has also interviewed U.S. Vice President Al Gore. James has created the men's club called Alpha Male Club. He's host of the James Swanwick Show, a business mentor, and generally a cool guy. I got to hang out with him just last week, actually. It was kind of funny. We didn't plan it. We were both at Jim Quick's house and ended up getting a chance to just sit back and chat, which is really, really nice right before we got to record this podcast. And I wish I'd had a camera because we could have just done it live standing underneath like a giant sculpture of, of the Incredible Hulk, which is how Jim Quick rolls. So James, welcome to the show, man. Dave, it's so great to be here. Thank you so much for having me. That was a fun party. It was indeed. So, Jim, if you're listening, and I know you are, thanks, man. That was truly, truly epic. Um, that was his his basically hacking house full of superheroes for Superhero You. Really an amazing, amazing way to open your house to to your friends. Yeah, that was awesome. Um, I got to talk to Brandon Routh as well. He was a really great guy. Uh, um, you know, played Superman, obviously, in that movie Superman Returns back in the day. Very health conscious does the bulletproof diet you'd be proud to, uh, proud of him for that david wouldn't you oh brandon's awesome um he was actually up here uh, in the the call it a studio my little biohacking laboratory and we were running current over him so we just just an amazing guy so it's kind of cool to see what people i see on tv are doing uh you know like they're actually doing bulletproof coffee and and it does the same things for them it does for me so it, it, it's just cool <laughs> though at a party you're like am i really here like this this is pretty neat. <laughs> They're all saying to themselves, like, wow, Dave Asprey's at this party. Oh, my God, I really made it. <laughs> I, I somehow doubt that, but it's still – it's just cool to to be able to just go out and and meet people who are, are on the same level, interested in, in performing well, even though it's a different industry than the one I come from. Uh, you can see the commonalities there. It's, uh, it, it's just cool. And you're kind of one of those interesting guys because – you you cross over. I mean, you spent some time in Hollywood, some time in politics, and uh, certainly a lot of time in sports, which is a different environment than, than Hollywood. How does all that fit together with what you do for Alpha Male Club? It, it seems kind of disjointed, but I'm sure it's not. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, as your listener or viewer can tell, I'm Australian, and I always wanted to, to live in America, and I came over here around 2003, and I started off... Um, building a house in Bel Air with a bunch of illegal Mexican immigrants for about $75 cash a day before I figured out that I actually wanted to, to live here and, you know, full time in, in the United States. So I figured out my visa situation and I said, how am I going to make a living for myself here? So I turned myself into a, uh, a celebrity journalist. What I, what I mean by that is I started interviewing movie stars. The first interview was um, I did was Jack Nicholson for the film uh, Anger Management. He was in um, that movie with uh, Adam Sandler. It was a great uh, movie. Yeah, it was a really funny movie. And that was the that was the first interview I got to do. It was in the penthouse suite of the uh, Armitage Hotel in Beverly Hills. And then I got to interview Arnold Schwarzenegger and then Angelina Jolie and just went from there, really. And um, it was great. I did that for about five or six years. Um, and then what I really wanted to do growing up was host a TV show. And so an opportunity came about to... Um, audition for Sports Center on ESPN. They were looking for an international anchor. And, uh, you know, I set about a plan. And 90 days later, I um, made my debut hosting Sports Center on ESPN. I really did realize a 20-year 20 20 year dream um, of hosting a show. And to do it in America was just 
the icing of the cake. So yeah, you know, I've done a little bit of celebrity journalism, and then I hosted Sports Center on ESPN. And then since I left Sports Center, now I, I interview you know world renowned experts like yourself, Dave, um, for Alpha Mail Club and for my podcast uh, in iTunes, the James Swanick Show, just to teach. Yeah, I teach guys how to be better in their health, with their finances, a little bit about how to be better with women. And then I also teach women as well um, how to be better with men, how to be better with their health. I'm not the health expert, but I am the interviewer of the experts. So I guess that kind of makes me an expert in some way. A lot of people don't understand that. Is that it's one thing to know all the stuff. It's another thing to be able to help someone talk about it. And before I started doing this show, for about 10 years, I worked in an anti-aging nonprofit group called the Silicon Valley Health Institute. I'm still chairman. And moderating meetings just over and over and over really taught me a lot. Like, what do people want to hear? And how do you translate from, like, these super smart people who sometimes don't know how to put their ideas into into practice? Uh, for me, it was really a beneficial learning time in order to become able to do what I do here. And obviously your experience interviewing a bunch of people carries through into the success you've had with, uh, with Alpha Male Club. Yeah, it's great. I mean, when you, I mean, I grew up in, in Australia as a reporter for a Rupert Murdoch broadsheet. Um, and so I had to go out there and just interview regular people for regular stories. And then I, it was just heightened, I guess, when I came to America, I got to interview people like Magic Johnson and David Beckham and, um, you know, Tom wow. Brady, um, you know, at ESPN, I got to hang out with Magic Johnson in the in the ESPN cafeteria uh, a couple times, which was really fun. Um, before we would go on air, and that was great. But you know, th those kind of skills, is, um, in terms of interviewing people and asking people the right questions and trying to extract relevant and interesting information from people, you know, I really learned that back in Australia, but then just you know brought it over to the US. And now, you know, I interview a whole lot of people on on the James Swanick Show and my podcast and obviously for Alpha Male Club. And, you know, I just love, love, love learning from people. I don't claim to be the number one expert or the expert. I just love to interview the experts. It's just, it's so much fun. Well, so the, something else that people probably don't know about you that I learned at Jim's party is that you read a book a day. Yeah. So, yeah, so just, so uh, yeah, just to, yeah, go ahead. Just to clarify that, on the days that I read a book, I read a book a day. So at the moment, I'm averaging about three or four a week. I know it's, it sounds like I'm doing like seven books uh, a week every single day, but I, uh, which is not, um, which is not true. I don't do that because it's, it's an impossible. Well, I find it impossible at pace to keep up with. But I am averaging three or four books a day. I set aside the time, uh, ninety minutes um, to two hours. Uh, you mean uh, three morning. or four books a week, not a day? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah. That so listeners be... don't like. Hey, he said that. No. <laughs> we, we, it was just a mis mis speech. I've got Superman in my mind with Brandon Routh, you know. <laughs> but yeah, I do. Re I read three or four books a week. So on the days that I read a book, I read a book a day. Um, and I learned that skill from from a business coach I had called Ty Lopez. Um, and he really sort of rammed that home into me. He said, like, if you want to educate yourself, uh, if you want to learn as much as you can, just learn the art of speed reading and discipline yourself to read a book a day. So. When I first started, it was very hard, Dave. I mean, it was real, really hard. Uh, but then after about a week or two, I started to get it down packed where I was getting it down to about two hours. And now I've got it at about 90 minutes. The hardest thing really is just creating that time space within your day um, and just shutting off the phone, shutting off the distractions and just, and just concentrating. But I've got to tell you, I feel, I feel a lot smarter than I did than before I learned that skill. And it's great in conversation, dinner parties, you can, you know, not, you're not, obviously not trying to show off your knowledge, but you can actually bring a level of intelligence and perspective to conversations, whereas before, you know, maybe I, I couldn't do that as much. One of the things I've been playing around with is some new software that lets you read much faster. I've, I'm a biohacker, so I just do weird things. One of the things I did is I wore these special glasses with a, a camera that watches my eyes while I read because it, it turns out I probably should have had dyslexia. I didn't realize this until I did some work with Helen Erlin, the creator of those orange glasses I wear, and she spoke at the Bulletproof Conference, and we're, we're just doing a transcript of that. We're going to be putting it online. Mm -hmm. And 
what I found is that around the words, there's all sorts of like weird shapes and moving colors, and I just learned to ignore them. So I didn't even recognize they were there until someone said, hey, can you see those? I'm like, oh my God, how did I miss them? And what saved me from being dyslexic is that my eye tracking is perfect. Like, like they said, it was as perfect as they'd ever seen when they were doing this, this eye tracking movement thing. But it's still a lot of work. In fact, for me, my eyes don't, don't team up as well as, as many people, so it's probably more work for mine to do it. So eye fatigue can set in, which comes through as just generalized fatigue. So this new software moves, it, it keeps your eyes in one spot on the screen, and it moves the words through it for you. So just blink, blink, blink really fast. And it's shocking what you can read when you hold your eyes still, because the words just go right into your brain. And the only problem is you can't get a lot of books into that kind of reading software yet. But I'm really hopeful that I'll be able to totally crank up my reading rate by using software to move the words so my eyes don't have to. Yeah. You ever play with that? I mean, I've never played with that. It sounds a little bit more technical than what I do, but I'm definitely going to try that. Um, I I have a, an approach where I... I look at the chapters. So I open the book. In fact, I actually recorded a video on this. It's on my podcast. It's a, the September 3rd, 2014 episode. So if you go to the James Swanick Show on iTunes, you can actually see a video of me teaching how I read, read a book in, in 90 minutes. But just to summarize what I do, I read the chapters. I read the back of the book so I've got an idea. If it's a classic or, so, or I know, it's, you know a lot has been written about that book, I'll even go to the Wikipedia page and just read that for like two or three minutes. So I've got an idea. So I've got an overview of the three, four, five main themes of what I'm about to read. So by the time I then start, it's not like I'm, what is this all about? I've got a general idea. Then I'll quickly flick through the book and I'll look at, I'll, I'll flick through most of the pages and I'm just glancing. I'm looking at headlines. I'm looking at the first sentence of certain paragraphs. I'm going through, that takes me about 10 minutes or so, and now I've got this idea in my mind. Okay, I know what the author's saying, I know what the theme is, now I'm going to go back and, okay. and really di digest this. So then, by the time I've begun, I'm like, I'm, I feel like I'm already a step ahead. So then it just comes down to, I'm, I'm going from top to bottom, I'm looking very quickly, I'm looking at the first sentence of each paragraph, is that something interesting? Yep, okay, yep, moving moving all right no this doesn't look too interesting oh this is interesting i'm just going to spend a little bit of extra time here okay now i'm flipping again oh okay i understand this point and that, that's just the way i do it for the next you know next 90 minutes or, or so and by the time i close that book i can tell you what that book is about i can tell you three main points of it and i can then use that you know i've digested the information i can then go and utilize that in my in my own life so it's not like people say, wow, you didn't really read the book. You didn't read every single word. You're right. I didn't read every single word. My eyes glanced over every single word. I didn't digest every word, but I digested the absolute main points of that book. Having just written The Bulletproof Diet, it's painful as an author to me to, to subtract words because when I write, I, I try to never use an extraneous word. It's actually a really big part of, of my focus. I'm like, okay, I'm, ne I'm never wasting a word. So when you get to a point, like, ah, oh, I've got to cut 5,000 words to hit my length, you do it. And then you, you hear some kind of, you know, Yahoo Outback guy like you who's just going to skim the book and not absorb every single word. <laughs> I mean, it's going to push my author ego. No. Uh, but it, it's funny because what a good author does is make every word just, just, so valuable that, that you can't do it. And there are so few books like that <laughs> where you pick it up. I don't know. You must've found these where you pick it up and you're going to read the way you're doing it. And you go, no, I have to read every single word. What author pulled that off the best? Where I had to read every single yeah, word. Yeah, like, you... Charlie, Charlie Munger uh, wrote a book called poor Charlie's Almanac. And it's a big, thick, heavy set book. And it's uh, Charlie Munger is the business partner of Warren mm -hmm. Buffett. He's one of the richest men in the world. And it's just, it's amazing to get into his psyche, to get into his mind and to see and understand how he thinks when it comes to investing. I haven't always been so interested in investing, but in the last three or four years, I've become obsessed with it. And so to read the mind of Charlie Munger, who's one of the, the greatest investors of all time, he and Warren Buffett together, was just a real pleasure. So I literally, I read every single word. And not only did I read every single word, but I went back on it again and read it again. One other book as well, a um, book called the, uh, the Happiness Hypothesis by Jonathan Haidt. He's a New York, uh, New York professor. 
I mean, that book blew me away. Um, and that took me um, a couple of days to read, even though I could have read it in 90 minutes. But that was a topic that I was particularly interested in. So I really took my time. I really digested it. I took notes. I made little comments on, on, on my computer, you know, on, on interesting things. And then I reached out to him at the end of it and said, can I have you on the James Swanick show? And, and he agreed. And I got to interview him about it for, for, for 60 <laughs> minutes, which was a real treat as well. It, it's really amazing. So few authors pull that off. And there's always nuggets of amazing information. So I, I really appreciate the way that, that you read those books. And for, for people who are listening, if you can increase the number of ideas in your mind, even if you miss the nuances, cool. And if you have one of those books that, that's so amazing where you want to just skim it, but you couldn't, uh, tell me about those on Facebook. I, I appreciate that because those are the kind of books I want, I want to read. Uh, from my own perspective, just since we're sharing this with, with listeners, uh, Good Calories, Bad Calories by Gary Tobbs was, was you have to be into food for, for that to matter. But it was this thick tome. People said it was too scientific, but I, I couldn't find a wasted word. I, I wanted to skim it. I, I read lots and lots of books on health and nutrition, but I had to read every word in that because there was a story and there was science. And that's maybe one of the, the last ones on that line that I've seen. And anything by Neil Stevenson, but, you know, I, I read fiction way too rarely and most of the fiction i read has uh -huh. something to do with seven and five year olds so <laughs> and i'm reading aloud <laughs> yeah i'd say there's another good book michael Pollan's um omnivore's D dilemma and that was a book that i read uh but i didn't read every word because a lot of the stuff he was talking i i, I had already known because i'd read articles on him beforehand so i could skim over some of those pages but that was a terrific book and also um just staying on the health theme here uh, is it salt, salt, sugar, fat? I'm just looking at my, yeah, salt, sugar, fat. I'm just looking at my uh, library behind me. You can see it, mm -hmm. Dave. It's, it's yep. my library of, of hard copy books that I have. But uh, have you read that book? Salt, oh, salt, yeah. And in fact, I, it was amazing because I've been giving a talk about salt and health for a long time. And when I saw that, I'm like, yes, uh, th this, is, this is so right. And so Gary's one of those guys. Uh, um, the other guy is Stephen Kotler. The Rise of Superman was one of those books. He did headline at the Bulletproof Conference. Um, but what, one of the reasons he headlined there, and one of the reasons I'm supporting the Flow Genome Project, um, his big work on hacking the human body, uh, I'm actually supporting it on AngelList. I just opened a, a syndicate so that I can um, help with investment there because I think that's such a, an important thing. But it's because the writing was so good and with Abundance with Peter Diamandis and Stephen Collar together, that kind of like, like professional writer, for me, it's a real treat. And I, I get this, this feeling, I don't, tell me if you think this is true because you actually read more books than I do, that it's getting easier and easier to publish. So the velocity of publishing is going up but the average quality of books maybe hasn't gone up as much because it's cheaper to publish. You think that's true? Yeah, no, it absolutely is true. It's never been easier to, to have a book published. People are publishing on Amazon all, all the time. Um, that's why you have to be picky. You have to be, have to be choosy. Yeah. And, you, and, you know, I, I read a book. One friend was like swore by this book for a year. He's like, you've got to read it. You've got to read it. It's amazing. It was called Pimp, I think it was. By, <laughs> African American in the 1960s, who was who was a pimp and you know beat up his <laughs> his uh, his uh, clients or beat up his women and all this stuff. And I'm reading this, I'm like, why did my friend insist that I read this book? And I still don't, I still to this day have no clue why he he was so insistent on me reading because I read him like this doesn't add to my life in any way, shape, or form. So you do have to be very careful about which which books you you do sit down and spend your 90 minutes or two hours with. Yeah, it it makes it makes sense to put really careful filters in place for what you allow yeah. with your mind anyway. Well, so so do you definitely we got way more into reading than I thought we would because uh, you're you're just an interesting guy who's done a lot of things. But at at Jim's party where we hung out last, there was something else we had in common, and that was we went up to the bar and, and I ordered club soda with lime, and and you did the same thing. Why did you quit drinking four years ago? Yeah. Uh, I took a month off every year for three years before I actually stopped uh, completely. And I just remember in realizing how better I felt at the end of those 30 days. So I, when I first moved to Los Angeles, I started playing rugby for the Los Angeles Rugby Club. And if you know anything about rugby culture, it's at the end of a game, you go to the pub and you just down schooners and jugs of beer. 
you know, and it's that's the camaraderie. And so I did that and it was fun. And I'm from Australia and there's a very heavy drinking culture in Australia. But I experimented um, around 2000, 2007 with, with just seeing if I could go 30 days without having a drop of alcohol. And it was the end of, um, I did it in March because in January I always go to the Sundance Film Festival in Park City, Utah, and I drink drank quite heavily there. And then the Super Bowl was on. I'd always go to the Super Bowl wherever it was, and I would drink quite heavily there. And so by the time March rolled around, I was ready to take a break. So to answer your, your question, I, after these, these uh, three years of taking 30, 30 days off, um, I woke up in Austin, Texas in, 2000, <laughs> in 2010 uh, at the South by Southwest Festival. There's and, no drinking at South by Southwest now. <laughs> but yeah, I was in Austin at the South by Southwest Festival. And uh, I had a couple of drinks that night. I think I had gin and tonic. It was only a couple of drinks. It wasn't even a big night. And I woke up in this hotel outside, just on the outskirts of Austin. And I went and had a, a, a breakfast at the International House of Pancakes that was sort of adjacent to this hotel. And I opened up the, the menu and the, the menu had photos of all of the food that they were serving, these big, bright, nasty colors. And I looked over and there were these two huge, overweight Americans there stuffing their face with this food. And I, the, the, the two drinks that I had the night before just made me feel kind of ill. And it was just a particularly bad hangover. And so I just said to myself there and then, I said, you know what? I'm going to see if I can beat my record of 30 days. I'm just going to see if I can go to, to 35 days. So let's just, let's just see how we go. So I began that day, I got to 35 and said, wow, I've lost about 10 pounds of fat. My skin's better. I'm sleeping better. I'm more productive. Uh, I'll just keep going. And then I got to 40 days and I said, I'll see if I can get to 50 days. Then it was, I'll see if I can get to three months. And I got to three months and I realized that the quality of my relationships was better. I had better friends, nicer friends. I wasn't as irritable. Um, my dating life was surprisingly good, actually. I was meeting a, a higher quality of woman. So I just went, I'll just keep going. I got to six months. And then I said, I wonder if I can go a year. So I went to 12 months and I was back in South by Southwest, back in Austin the following year. And I went into a bar and I ordered a Budweiser and I put it to my mouth to have a celebratory one year anniversary of no drinking drink. And I went, you know what? I'll just see how long I can go. So I put it back down I gave it back to the, back to the waiter, paid for my drink and I haven't, haven't drunk since. So it's been about four and a half years now. Uh, and I can honestly say that Quitting the drinking has made my life kind of explode in productivity. I feel more positive. I'm healthier. Um, I mean, there's only been, been positive benefits to it. I was blown away when recently Tim Ferriss put out a 30-day no drinking, no masturbating challenge. And, <laughs> yeah, I read and that. at the same time, I'm like, you go, Tim. Like, that just rocks. Uh, and... I don't drink. I, I can say the last drink I had was, I don't know, it was actually three months ago, and it was about an inch of red wine way older than I am. Mm. <laughs> and I'm, I'm happy to do that. And So 21 years old then, yeah? Uh, pretty old. much. I'm an anti-aging yeah. guy, so I don't yeah. age. <laughs> but what what's really interesting is, is that even that, I, I felt it a little bit, but people suck at understanding long-term consequences because mm. we're biologically not wired for that. Like we're relatively short-sighted and you see this in our stock market and you see this in, well, the hangover. <laughs> but yeah. what doesn't show up is that, oh, you, you know, you had the glass of red wine, you had the Budweiser, whatever it was. And then the next morning you just had one. So you're like, I'm not that off. Like maybe I just feel fine. But later that day, you can't find the word you wanted. You're a little bit cranky. You yell at your kids. And so it, I found it to be like a, kind of a subtle, sneaky lowering of my performance. And when I was just like, look, I just don't do that. I always order something that will hydrate me, not dehydrate me. <laughs> and I'm, I'm good to go. And, and I just don't miss it. I, I don't crave it. That the quality for me is the same thing. Quality of relationships, quality of performance, and my ability to focus, it's just there. And like, what did I lose? I didn't because I have a lot more money because when I go out, even if I drink like the sparkly Norwegian water blessed by peacocks, it's still cheaper <laughs> than cheap beer, right? Like how do you yeah. lose? Yeah, you know, the word there is uh, irritability. Like yeah. like when you drink, even if you're not that hungover, even if it's just, you're just a little bit hungover, you're irritated throughout the day, aren't you? It's just the mm -hmm. general feeling of unpleasantness. You know, it's just kind of like, I uh, shouldn't have had those 
two drinks last night. I shouldn't have had those three beers. Uh, you know, I had that big heavy meal with the fries and the burger and that with the two beers and the glass of red wine. I'm just, it's not like I'm hung over, but I'm just like irritated. So what I found was when I was, when I was drinking, I wasn't drinking heavily. I was never an alcoholic, but I was often irritated when I gave up the alcohol, when I quit, I rarely got irritated. Yeah. Rarely. The, the world becomes kind of a brighter place because a situation that would have been irritating isn't. So then your sort of bad attitude doesn't happen. And then like you're, you're nicer to people and you make better decisions. And, and then all of a sudden you got a promotion or, uh, you know, you, you did something that maybe you would have missed. And, and at levels of high performance, small variances equals big differences in where you rank. You know, if you want to be the world's best at something, if you have a 1% or a 5% difference in how you perform, you can go from being top 3 to being top 300. So I, I found it was just a performance inhibitor. I was kind of carrying around this invisible anchor uh, that would pop up its head at, at crazy times, and I just wasn't getting a lot of benefit. But the one benefit that does come from drinking is that it, it lets you, quote, have a good time. So what do you do to have a good time if you're not going to be out drinking? I have a good time anyway, Dave. I mean, I get this question all the time. It's like, how do you have a good time when you're not drinking? Like, how do you handle it? I'm like, well, I just handle it. Not only do I handle it, but I can almost guarantee that most of the time I'm having a hell of a lot better time than the people who are drinking. I mean, I'm clear in thought. I'm clear in mind. I've got lots of energy. I dance like a crazy person. I've danced on tables before. I've, you know, just been the life of the party all without drinking. People the next day going, wow, you were really drunk wait, last night. That, that's genetic. You're Australian. You guys can't help it. <laughs> yeah, we're just, I just like to show off, Dave. Yeah, there you go. I'm an extrovert. <laughs> but, you know, it, it, it doesn't change. Like nothing changes. I mean, I, I mean, sorry, everything changes in terms of how you feel the next day and how you feel in that moment. But... In terms of the level of fun that I would have, I mean, that didn't change. If anything, I had I had had more fun. Um, just to, going back to what you said there, like the two millimeter difference, just on the irritability thing. I was at a Tony Robbins seminar in uh, Dallas, Texas, uh, in uh, October 2014, and he was saying that the difference. He was talking about the difference between being good at something, being excellent at something, and being outstanding at something. And he said that. Most people today think that they're excellent, or maybe they are excellent. But if you're excellent today, you only get good results. It used to be if you were excellent, you got excellent results. But today, with competition the way it is, if you're excellent at something, you only get good results. So he said, why not be outstanding, which is one step above excellent? And guess what? The difference between excellent and outstanding is only two millimeters. That's all it is. So... That's just an analogy where it comes, you know, when you were referring before, like it's just 1%, 2%, 3% difference can be the difference between getting outstanding, being outstanding and getting outstanding results and only getting good results. That is, uh, that's a, a major difference. And it's funny that we have escalation of those words because I've noticed that I'm, I'm a, a relatively fit guy. Since I lost my 100 pounds, I went from being like a double extra large shirt. I, I'm a solid size large, but lately, and, and I've actually put on muscle, not lost muscle, I go to the store and I have to buy a medium shirt because there's like size inflation. As Americans get fatter and fatter, what used to be a size large is, is or what used to be a size extra large is now labeled large so that there's like size mm. inflation. So maybe mm. from like an excellence thing, we have an excellence inflation where I want to be uber excellent because I have to have to top Tony Robbins and they'll be like upgraded, <laughs> uber, super duper, fabulous, excellent. Uh, but it, it's, it's bulletproof outstanding. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it's it's funny, but it's true. It, it also, how many billion people do we have? Six, six and a bit, yeah. And there's that statistic that the top 20% of uh, students in either China or India exceeds the total number of students in the U.S. <laughs> You're like, wow. yeah, there's a little bit of competition in the world. Both you know, everyone's competing with everyone else. And we've got globalization there, so. It's not about beating other people, but it's about being excellent. And if you're going to work on being excellent, you do have an awful lot of other excellent people who you're both collaborating with, but also potentially competing with. And 
it, so it becomes more and more important. And if you're it, it just taking you know a few nights of the week and doing something that makes you weak instead of stronger, I, over the long term, the the difference in your trajectory could could be substantial. So how do you perform uh, the day after you have a drink or two? I mean, I know you say you don't drink, but when you have that drink, is it enough to affect your ability? Do you notice it? I'm relatively sensitive, like my immune system. I've had lots of autoimmunity. I've lived in buildings with water damage, had toxic mold. So even if I do uh, vodka or something like that, if I don't take supplements that counteract what the alcohol does, I'll feel it. And the first place I feel it is in my brain. So the next morning, I, I just... I should wake up on the average day and just be able to bring it. Like, okay, I get out of bed. I want to think of something. I want to bring all the energy I have to bear that day. I don't have to sit and meditate. I don't have to do jumping jacks. I can just turn it on. And after I have that one drink the next morning, it takes a lot of effort to turn it on. Mm -hmm. And my goal, that state of high performance that I seek, is to make it where it's effortless. I wanted the energy. I brought the energy. And all of a sudden, it's not effortless. I don't want to expend my willpower doing simple things. I want to expend it doing great things. And alcohol makes me spend my willpower on trivial things. And that's why I don't drink it other than on an extreme special occasion where it's ceremonial, yeah. not for, for pleasure. Now, the, the listener is probably thinking, well, I'm not going to quit alcohol. That's just unrealistic because it might be part of his or her culture. Yeah. And maybe it's they're just used to it and they love a glass of red wine. Guess what? I love a glass of red wine and I love a beer, an ice cold beer on a hot day. Hey, I, I love I, a shot of heroin too, just so we're all clear. <laughs> I, I mean, yeah. no, just kidding. You I have never tried it. <laughs> so the, the point I'm trying to make here is that you, you don't have to be an extreme like I am at, the, at this point point in my life. You, like, you can just cut it back. You can just cut it back a couple times a week. You can just have two drinks instead of three or just have one drink instead of two. That's what Dave and I are talking about. That's the 2% yep. as well. So, so I'm, not, I'm not here preaching like, oh, everyone should give up yeah. alcohol. Yeah, just it's un- unnecessary. It. Yeah. It's unnecessary. You know, and go and have, have a, bit, a bottle of wine on, on a Saturday night or Friday night or with your friends or whatever. Do it. But just just if you can, or if you want to be at optimum performance, and you want to be outstanding, and you want to live a bulletproof life like Dave talked about, <laughs> then just know your limit, yeah. reduce it maybe, and just and and just and fine tune it. No one's saying you got to quit quit alcohol altogether, but just fine tune it a little bit. Just cut it back, or cut, cut back the the number of drinks you have, or the the, the regularity of what you have it. Yeah, recognize that you're taking a hit when you have even one drink. It, it doesn't come at no expense. And if it's an expense that you, you want to incur, then do it and, and drink the good stuff. <laughs> You'll have less of a hangover anyway, and you can block some of the hangover using like the hangover hacking techniques that are out there. So if you think that you're invincible, ah, one glass of red wine won't do anything to me, then you won't do anything to block the effects of the negative parts of the red wine. You got the pleasure of it. So just recognize that there's a cost because right now we sort of think that the only cost is economic but it's not it it takes energy and that's something that that maybe isn't in our consciousness that ought to be well it's just on a financial point of view i would say that stopping drinking has probably saved me i don't know I, i've tried to figure it out in my head but it's at least ten thousand uh, dollars a year in just real costs of drinking and drinking related activities probably another fifty thousand dollars a year in lost revenue um, because of a lack of productivity because of drinking. So it's anywhere from, I would estimate, you know, like 50 to 100 grand a year is what it costs me if I was if I was drinking. Um, like I said, just on real costs and, and then lost productivity because of how I feel. I, I did, I have to admit, I, I tried to do that equation, but I, I shifted all of my spend from alcohol to coffee. So uh, I'm afraid it was a wash for me. <laughs> You know, I'll tell you what my alcohol is now, like the thing that makes me feel bad is if I have pasta or risotto or something like that. It's like if I eat that, the next day I wake up yeah. and my guts are just awful. I feel so sluggish. What's what's going on there, Dave, to explain that? Oh, you're, you're getting the effects of gluten, which makes gluteomorphin in the average person's gut. So it's actually an opiate. And in a good number of people, it triggers autoimmunity to one of seven kinds of tissues in your body. So you can get subtle inflammation. Uh, you're also getting excessive carbs, insulin, blood sugar swings, and 
depending on where you got the wheat, it's incredibly likely that there are meaningful but not illegal amounts of things like aflatoxin and other fungi that grow naturally in the field that we don't filter out. This is a known problem in grains forever. About 24% of the world's food supply gets ruined by mold during growing and storage every year. This is one of the subjects of the documentary I just finished shooting, so I'm really up to date on the statistics. But when mm -hmm. you're eating that stuff, it's really tough to know. There's even a new practice in the U.S. of spraying glyphosate onto a wheat crop because it makes for a slightly higher yield. So you're basically spraying Roundup on food that people are going to eat so you can slightly get a little bit more wheat and it causes a more evening of the, the ripeness of the wheat before you harvest it. So you're getting an extra dose of pesticide in there as well. And yeah. there's, there's good arguments that say if you can afford to not eat pasta and things like that, you might want to steer clear of that for the same reason that you might want to recognize what happens if you're drinking you know, a, a cheap beer like the next morning. If you want to feel really good, then choose a meal that'll make you feel good. And if you just want to celebrate, you want to eat the stuff you love and you just love pasta, then eat the pasta. But recognize the cost. If you think you're doing it for free, then you're really stuck. That's exactly what I, you just said it perfectly. I say, I actually, <clears throat> I was on Ben Greenfield's uh, podcast a few weeks ago and, and I was telling a similar story about how I don't drink and I, I got a client out of it. Someone reached out to me and said, oh, I really want to cut back the amount of alcohol that I drink. It's affecting my relationship with my husband and uh, et cetera, et cetera. And everything that you just said, Dave, is what I say to her and now what she's saying back to me. And in three weeks, she's gone from, having um being hung over and not sleeping properly so not sleeping properly on a sunday night being hung over and unproductive on a monday to cutting it back to just one drink on a sunday afternoon sleeping perfectly waking up in the morning fresh and having a great relationship with her husband and all she did was just cut out two or three drinks in the last second part of the week and all of a sudden like her life her life has transformed so you know, like, like, <clears throat> excuse me, like we say, it's only just a little thing. It's a little adjustment. For me, it's don't eat pasta because when I eat pasta, I feel like crap. Um, yeah, it, that pasta is on the kryptonite food part of the, the Bulletproof Diet. And by the way, I have to do a plug because it's that time of year. Bulletproof Diet book launches December 2nd. If you haven't ordered on Amazon yet and you listen to the show, I'd be so thankful if after more than 150 free episodes, you ordered the book because that'll help it hit the New York Times number one spot, which is the goal. Yeah. The reason that's Absolutely. the goal? And I want to help you, Dave. So I'm going to have you on my show, the James Swanick Show, and, and talk about the book to my audience as well. Thank you. And we'll get you. it up there at the New York Times for sure. Thanks so much. And this is this is one of those things where I, I want to share the knowledge because when people learn things like what you're talking about here, James, about the things that make them weak, you could, if you could just identify them, I'm not saying never do them, but just know what they are so you know your kryptonite. Because once you do that, it becomes a lot easier. So you can dial in the level of weakness or strength that's appropriate for the kind of day you want to have. No one ever taught me that, and I spent a lot of time and money doing it. So if I can teach someone how to do that in my book, and that makes them have better emotional regularity, less crankiness, they'll be nicer to each other. And then, well, that'll be nice. And Dave, I promise to read every single word of your book. <laughs> Liar. There'll be no speed reading going on when I get to a book. <laughs> Dave, I've got a question. I want to ask you a question, a health-related question, because I thank you so much. You, you were very kind uh, uh, to send me some MC2 oil in, in, the, in the mail recently, and I, I thank you for that. Um, today, I had uh, I put uh, a cap full of MCT oil in my shake with my, with my greens, um, with the green powder, and I drank it as I walked back from the gym. And then when I got home, I made my breakfast and I put another cap of MC2 oil over my uh, um, my salmon and my grass-fed butter and a little bit of sauerkraut there for some probiotics. Um, and then about an hour later, I started to get uh, tummy problems. I, I suspect it's because I've had too much of it. Maybe I put two caps, two caps is too many. But why would I be having a troublesome gut from taking the MC2 because when I take just the one cap, was it okay? So there's two different ones. That there's brain octane oil and there's XCT oil, and they're both different from sort of the generic MCTs. There's a lot of companies that are labeling things as MCT oil, even though they're long chain. Like like so, people say coconut oil 62% MCT. It, it's a marketing scam they're doing. Mm -hmm. So. Um, I just want to make sure which one of my two. It was yours. It was. It wasn't the orange one. It wasn't the brain octane. Brain. It was the XCT uh, then. Okay. XCT. Yes, it was. Got yeah. It. 
So most people respond, like the XCT is harder on the gut than brain octane, which is oh. one of the reasons I prefer brain octane. And the reason is that the 10 carbon chain fat that's in there requires a little bit more digestion before it goes into mm -hmm. energy. Whereas the brain octane is the shortest chain of the medium chains. It's the most rare one in coconut, but it's the one that causes the actually very little digestive distress unless you just drink like half a cup of it. But olive oil at half cup doses is also bad. So <laughs> yes. when you get too much of the XCT oil, what happens there is your gut microbes get a little bit upset by that and your body can't absorb it fast enough. So that can cause what we affectionately refer to as disaster pants. And the trick is to teach your body to be a fat burning body. And when you do that, you can handle quite a lot more. So I find most people buy the XCT oil because it's, it's more economical. And then most people go for the brain octane because they get a bigger mental boost. They get more energy from it and it's just mm -hmm. easier on the body. So there's a trade off between cost and efficiency as there is in almost everything you do in life. Okay. So I should just maybe stick it, bring it back down to just the one capsule. Yeah. And, uh, and the number is different. I, I know a couple of people where a teaspoon is like all they can handle because like their, their thyroids turn on and they're like, oh, I'm really warm. And then after a few months of that, they're like, oh, I can handle two, three teaspoons. So it's sometimes just a question of how much energy is your body willing to turn on? Because if you have mitochondria that don't use sugar anymore, but can use ketones, different people can respond very dramatically. You, you're pretty healthy. Um, mm -hmm. Just having met you in person a few times, I, I doubt you have major mitochondrial dysfunction. So for you, it's probably just a, a localized gut distress. Yeah, yeah. Okay, good. Thank you. That's uh, so, solved my problem. Done. Yeah, just back off a bit. <laughs> yeah, okay. I will. Now, I, you talk about all sorts of stuff that I don't really talk about on, on Bulletproof Radio. Things like uh, dating, role-playing, men and, men and women, and one of the things I was going to ask you is something I've seen a lot on your Twitter feed, which is you know, why do women test men? Like, let's get into some of your alpha male stuff just because it, it's going to be interesting for both women and men who are listening to get your take on this because you coach guys on how to, you know, how to be successful in dating because let's, let's face it, a lot of us guys could use that. Yeah, well, women, the short answer, and by the way, let me just preface this by saying I'm not the expert, but I'm the interviewer of the experts. So what I've been told. <laughs> yeah, yeah, disclaimer of liability here. I got it. <laughs> liability. What I've been told by the experts is that women want to feel a man's masculinity. They want to feel like he cannot fail a test because it goes back to sort of, you know, 10,000 years ago. It's like the woman wants the strong man, the man who's going to kill the bear that's coming to eat her the bear that's coming to, uh, to eat the children, the, the, the opposing tribes who might come and rape her and pillage the town, all that kind of stuff. So a, a woman is inherently attracted to a very strong alpha male man. So when she tests you, or when she tests the man, I should say, she's looking to see whether you're going to flunk the test or whether you're going to stand strong in the test. And she wants you to stand strong. So if you've ever had a situation where a woman just like, just eats away at you for no reason, like pushes your buttons for no reason. It's like everything's going perfectly and then she'll find something that's wrong and she'll say something and all of a sudden there's a big fight created. Well, that's okay. She's just wanting to test you to see whether you are going to fight with her or whether you're going to just say, haha, that's funny, or just relax and be strong in that moment. I, I, thought, so, I thought that was just ovulation. No. <laughs> yes, very good, Dave. <laughs> I, like, I see what you did there. <laughs> So, so really, women, are te women are t test men because they just want to feel that the man is not going to fail the test. And the more she loves you, the more she will test you. And the more she tests you and the more you pass the test, the more she'll love you. It's only when we men react to it and say, you're crazy. What are you doing? You know, like, are you insane? What are you talking about? When we do that as men, we've failed the test. So now I, I got to push back a little bit on this. I mean, there's definitely some major stereotyping going on. And, and what doesn't match this whole alpha male model is Prince mm -hmm. or the artist formerly known as Prince. As, as he <laughs> may be. Okay. The exact opposite of an alpha male. Like he, he looks like a peacock, <laughs> right? But when you read like the, the laws of seduction uh, by Robert Greene, the follow on to the laws of power, mm -hmm. I think they identified seven different types of male behavior. And some of them are super alpha. Others, you know, the guy who will do anything for sex, including like humiliate himself, you know, by dressing up funny and climbing up vines up windows. I don't remember <laughs> the story very well. And, you know, then there's the, the fop and I don't remember the other kinds. But I was intrigued that they mapped out all these things. 
is there like maybe a ton of this alpha versus beta male you see in TV all the time? Like, like there's all these other kinds of things that women like. Do you coach all those or are you really like, hey, you got to be the alpha, always pay the bill, et cetera, et cetera? What I do is I try to get experts into Alpha Male Club for me to interview uh, to talk about how to be the best man they can be. There so, you go. So the very, what, I'm, what I am trying to teach to men who are members of Alpha Male Club is be a man of your word. Make your words and actions align. Take good care of your health. Have good relationships with your friends, with your acquaintances, with your family members. Respect women. Know how to be a gentleman. Just have your life in order. That, to me, is my definition of, an, of, of a man. So, and so, a, so floss and open doors. Got it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, you know, people think they hear this alpha male club and they go, oh, it's like the big gorillas banging their chest and it's a big, you know, misogynistic kind of thing. That's not it at all. It's really just how can you be the best man that you can be? Um, and especially, you know, in the areas that I, I like to interview guests on, which is money and finance, health and fitness, and then relationships, whether it's with women or whether it's with, uh, you know, acquaintances and, and male friends. I was down in L.A. the other day and I hung out with uh, Ken Rutkowski, the guy who runs Business Rockstars Radio. And he has a, a networking group Saturday morning called Metal. And it, it's a pretty influential group of people, but it's all guys. And it, it's not, you know, officially you know, segmented like that, but I was a little bit surprised and it's like, well, no, it's, it's guys get together and, and it changes kind of the energy that there's stuff that men do just like they have sort of, you know, sewing circles to be terribly stereotypical, but there are things that women do, book clubs, et cetera, where they get together and they do, I don't know, cause I don't go to those things. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and then guys, well, we all go to the bar and drink, whatever. And then there's like some sports things, but it feels like some of that stuff that guys do to be guys, like there's less of that now than there used to be, at least in big cities. Cities. Is that is that pretty accurate? Does that affect yeah. what you do with Alpha with Alpha Male Club? Yeah, and it's interesting because then when these conferences turn up or my product Alpha Male Club turns up, it's almost like it's an unusual thing, isn't it? We we look at it as unusual, like oh, it's a men's group. That's so weird. But you know, going back tens of thousands of years, when we were cavemen. There was you know guys would go off for days and weeks at a time. They'd have these um, these rituals and these. Um, um, and you know they would be spending a lot of time together, but like eat, eat mushrooms and hunt mastodons, and it was just yeah. a party. I, I get it. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> but you know, to actually get together with a, I mean, look, you and I are in an entrepreneurial group called the Brotherhood, which is all guys. Obviously, there are no women allowed in that. It's all guys, and the dynamic is is very different. Like you can talk about men's issues freely and openly without fear of ridicule, without fear of judgment. Um, just like women can go and talk, you know, there are some things that women should talk only to women about. Just like there are some things that guys should talk only to guys about. So anything that gets a man living the life that he feels he's supposed to and anything that gets a man being, congru uh, being congruent and anything that gets a man making sure that his words and actions align is, 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 is great with me. And if that means you go to a men's conference, if that means you sign up to Alpha Male Club and learn about men's issues, if that means you go and just hang out with your buddies and watching football on a Sunday and you don't take your girlfriend or your wife or your platonic girlfriends, then do it. Then just do it. And don't be ashamed. Don't be ashamed of it. Yeah, I'm sure we're going to get some interesting comments on this uh, on this on the blog post and on iTunes and all that stuff. Uh, I, I think that, that there's something to be said for for both genders, men and women, having lots of mixed gender time and occasionally just hanging out with with others from from your same gender. And that that there are strange benefits I can't entirely elucidate, but I, I support what you're saying there. And and there's there's something about that. We're like, hey, let's talk about stuff that we wouldn't talk about in mixed company for whatever reason. And I don't think we really know those reasons. But, I'll get, I'm just gonna, I'm just going to give one dating tip to 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 the woman listening as well, yeah, Dave. Yeah, Actually, please do. Yeah, because because I, I have a uh, I have a site called um, One in a Million Man dot com which teaches women how to attract their 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 one in a million guy basically and i've got a another podcast called date top 10 men in itunes as well where i i interview dating coaches and stick it um and put that up on the podcast but um we, you and i were talking about you know guys only groups and being in entrepreneurial groups and everything so the ladies listening if you want to meet a great guy go to a place where there are lots and lots of guys. And just like, I know it makes so simple sense. <laughs> Rocket right? science. <laughs> it's not, it's so simple, right? But here's this. I'm going to give you some examples. A business seminar 
a real estate conference, an entrepreneurial meetup. Now, this is not me being a, sexist. A monster truck rally? A monster truck rally is a good one. But <laughs> 75% of the guys in that room, are, of people in that room are men. I went to a real estate conference in San Diego six months ago. It was like, am I allowed to say this on your show? Am I allowed to kind of sure. swear? It was like a cock fest. I mean, it was just, there were just dudes everywhere. And there was only a handful of women. And those handful of women were loving it. They were loving it because they're surrounded by men. So I know was saying, I know you were about to sort of you know mock me and make fun of me because I said go to <laughs> go to a place where there are lots of guys. But Dave and I are talking about entrepreneurial guys, uh, entrepreneurial groups, right? Mm -hmm. Men, for whatever reason, are into business more than women. It's it's shown. It's been proven over and over again. So go to a business seminar. Go to a real estate conference. Go to an investor meeting. In fact, if you just if you buy one share in Berkshire Hathaway. Berkshire Hathaway is the company owned by Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger, who I referred to earlier. Uh, at the moment, I think it's trading about $133, $134 for a B share of Berkshire Hathaway. If you buy that one share, that enables you to attend the annual shareholders meeting uh, in Omaha, Nebraska uh, in May of every year. And when you go to that shareholders meeting, and it's a three-day event, by the way, it's 90% men and 10% women. And the 90% who are men are all like the world's wealthiest, richest investors, guys who are like bettering themselves, guys who are super motivated, the guys that I like to consider outstanding when we were talking about outstanding and excellent before. So just as a final tip, I don't want to turn this into a, like a dating dating podcast, Dave, but um, if you just go to where the men are and think about conferences, men's group, like, like literally hang on the periphery of those men's groups, go to those investor meetings, you are going to attract a great man into your life. I've got a, a little story about that. This sort okay. of stuff really happens, and I'm not going to say who this was, but at the Bulletproof Conference, we had like a special VIP dinner. It's relatively small groups of people, and you know, maybe 30 or 40 people, and, and me and some of our speakers. And it was uh, it was an additional fee for the food and everything. So I got one person who signed up and said, "I am coming absolutely, and I'd like to pay the extra fee." However. Uh, my requirement is that I be sat next to a single guy <laughs> <laughs> between this age and that other age <laughs> uh, because, uh, you know, I, I, I want a bulletproof guy. And so this is my strategy for meeting one. And, and you know, she was totally happy just to be open about that. Like I, she went there to meet people, not mm -hmm. in a predatory way, but in a, hey, I, I know what I want. I'm, I, I'm looking for that. And and likewise, I, I have to say some advice that, that my wife uh, before we uh, before we were married gave me. Uh, she was still living in Sweden, and she said, Dave, you should take up yoga. I said, all right, I'll go take up yoga. And, and she said, and my advice is find a super attractive yoga teacher. And, and I, I said, why would you say that? And, and she said, so you'll keep going to yoga. And <laughs> <laughs> now, that was good advice. But what I also did is I noticed in the average yoga class that even though this was in Silicon Valley where ratio of men to women is skewed, there's more men than women down there, mm -hmm. Uh, that it was nine women for every two men. And all of them, and this is going to be shocking, they were wearing yoga pants. <laughs> so if I had been single at the time, I would have been like, wow, this is amazing. Like, you know, what a great way to meet people. So it's the same thing. You know, go, go where the people you want to meet are. And, and in my case, anyway, I, I think there's something to be said for meeting someone who does yoga because they're probably doing other types of personal growth and they take care of themselves mm -hmm. and they exercise. So it works both ways. And just one last point on that. When I went to your conference in Pasadena, Dave, the biohacking conference, before I, as I was driving up, up there before I went, I said, you know what, I bet I meet a lovely lady here. I bet I meet just, you know, maybe I meet a couple of lovely women here um, and a, a lot of great guys. And you know what? I went into that biohacking conference and I did. I met uh, a couple of lovely ladies uh, who were very health conscious, very spiritual, um, really into their fitness. And, um, you know, I've stayed in contact with um with one of them i mean obviously what one of them i'm just you know was hey how you doing a little text message here and there but i've actually gone out and seen one of the, one of the, the women that i met at that conference so same thing it's like what kind of person do you want to attract into your life go to where that type of person hangs out it's like i want to hang out with a healthy spiritual fit woman it chances are that i'm going to meet one of those at dave dave asprey's biohacking conference yeah, that, that was the one who paid to sit next to you just kidding. No, <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> You're undermining me at every opportunity. <laughs> I'm just totally teasing. <laughs> uh, on that note, 
there's a question that I've asked every guest on the show at the end of the show. And that is, what are your top three pieces of advice for people who want to perform better at everything they do? So you've, you've had an interesting life. You've talked to all kinds of celebrities, all kinds of other people. So I'm really looking forward to your answer. The first one is, is, is so simple. Three words, just do it. It's like the Nike slogan, just do it. Because there've been so many times where I've been like, ah, should I do it, should I not do it? And I haven't taken action. And I've just, everything has stayed the same. When I've actually taken the action and I've actually taken that step and I've just said to myself, just do it, I do it and things happen. I was terrified going in for my audition at ESPN to become a sports center anchor. I was terrified and I just kept saying to myself over and over again, just do it, just do it, just do it, just do it, just do it. And I did. And I did a successful audition and I became a sports center anchor on, on ESPN. Uh, in fact, there's a whole blog post that I wrote on that. You can see the video of me making my debut. If you just type in uh, into Google how I bluffed ESPN, James Swanick, that whole story will come up and you can see the photos and the videos. Uh, the other thing uh, I would say is um, feel, the fe feel the fear and do it anyway. So feel the fear and do it anyway. Uh, I've been scared, terrified. I was scared to move to London from Brisbane back in 1998, and I did it anyway. I was scared to move to America in Los, in Los Angeles. I didn't know whether I was going to turn left or right out of Santa Monica, Air, uh, out of Los Angeles Airport uh, when I flew in there. I didn't know anyone in the States. I was scared, but I did it anyway. And then I was scared when I, when I did the, the ESPN audition, but I did it anyway. And it worked out great. So feel the fear and do it anyway. And then I'm, the, my third tip would be, um, and I'm going to, this is just something that I came up with recently after I did the Tony Robbins seminar uh, in Dallas, is be outstanding. Be and do outstanding. And what I mean by that is, how can you offer someone help? Do you talk to a homeless person on the street? Do you open the card, uh, uh, let a woman go into a rest, you know, through a sliding door first, for example? Do you stand up for a woman in her seat if you're a man? Uh, can you offer value without expecting anything back in return? Be outstanding. Be outstanding. Because people notice that. At, after Jim Quick's party last Saturday night, I sent him a text message the next day to say, thank you so much for having me. He texted back saying, thank you, James. Thank you so much for saying that. Glad you were there. That's outstanding. I'm not saying I'm outstanding. I'm saying that's me trying to be outstanding. Just little things like that. And people notice that and people connect with you. And anything that you want to do in life is, is going to happen if you just follow Be Outstanding. Very, very well said. We're going to put links to all of your sites in the show notes, but why don't you tell people where they can find you on Twitter and the main website they should go to to find more about your work, James. Yeah, thank you, Dave. My, my website is jameswanick.com. I'll spell it out for you because it's a little bit, uh, bit of a hard one. It's just James, J-A-M-E-S. Then S W A N W I C K. So it's spelled Swanwick, but it's pronounced Swanick. So yeah, jameswanick.com. Uh, you can get me in iTunes at the James Swanick Show. Uh, if you're a woman looking for dating advice, you can go to oneinamillionman.com or get me in, the, uh, in iTunes as well. And Twitter is just at James Swanick, and Instagram is at James Swanick. Thanks again for being on the show. Thank you, Dave. It was great, uh, great being chastised by you and made a made a mockery of throughout. Thank you. <laughs> I, I think we avoided chastity entirely, which, which is probably good. That that was Tim Ferriss's thing to go with the alcohol, so we'll leave that there. <laughs> it, if you enjoyed the show, I would be really grateful if you would head on over to Amazon or Barnes and Noble and order the Bulletproof Diet book now. If you do that and you forward your receipt to orderbulletproofdietbook.com, there's instructions on the website. I will send you a whole bunch of free stuff and keep sending you free stuff, things that I've created that go along with the book. So now is an ideal time to do it. And if you would just like to say thanks for the kind of content you just heard, this is the best way you could do it. It's the one thing I'm asking you to do for this entire week. <laughs> Have an awesome day. Did you know that Cyber Monday didn't even exist before 2005? And now it's the ultimate online shopping day of the year, even bigger than Black Friday? It's true, in fact, last year's Cyber Monday was the biggest online shopping and savings day ever. And now this December 1st, I'm upgrading Cyber Monday to help you hack your holiday shopping list by kicking off a special online event with exclusive savings. 
The savings continue on December 2nd when, in celebration of the Bulletproof Diet book launch, we're kicking off a 12 days of Bulletproof. That means you'll get great 24-hour savings on a different product in the Bulletproof online store every single day from December 2nd through December 13th. And in the spirit of giving, you can even save 25% more on top of the daily discounts and cross up to 12 names off your gift list all at once by getting the entire bundle of products with just one click of your mouse. If you haven't already, just make sure you sign up for email updates at Bulletproof.com or like Bulletproof on Facebook to make sure you get all the details. Then just mark your calendar to watch your email inbox and the Facebook page starting December 2nd for your invitations to each of the 12 days of Bulletproof. Thanks for listening, and I'm excited to help you give the gift of Bulletproof this holiday season.